understanding who your investor base is and what they want and then also you know figuring out a business model that can serve them i think will benefit you greatly on that welcome to multifamily insights i'm your host john kasman and i want to thank you for joining us for another great episode if you are enjoying this show, we want to hear from you. Leave us a rating and review. It helps other people find the show and also gives us great feedback to make the show work harder for your investing goals. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you leave us that five-star rating, honest feedback, and subscribe. All right, you got to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, we've got a good show today. We're going to be talking to Charles Seaman. They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you want to grow as a multifamily investor, you have to spend more time with other multifamily investors. And an easy way to do that is to join our apartment investing mastermind group today. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the mastermind button. Now, as a part of this group, you'll get access to expert trainings, group coaching calls, industry news and updates, as well as all of our webinars and workshops, including our three-hour workshop on raising capital. Again, if you want to be around other multifamily investors that can help you scale your portfolio today and grow your network, make sure you're a part of the Apartment Investing Mastermind. Just go to Kasman Capital. Charles Seaman resides in Charlotte, North Carolina, and serves as a managing partner of Cashflow Champs. He's responsible for building and maintaining broker relationships and performing and overseeing the company's underwriting activities. He's also involved with contract negotiation and capital raising to make sure the deals close, remain involved, remaining involved after closing to manage the assets so that they can perform in a manner that provides investors with ex exceptional returns. Let's welcome to the show, Charles Seaman. John, thanks for having me. It's a blast to be here today. Absolutely, Charles. Great to have you on. I went over your bio at a very high level. Why don't you take two minutes and fill in some of those gaps? Yeah, totally. So, you know, for me, I've always had a little bit of a a different start to how I got in the industry. I think a lot of people come in and they're they're aspiring investors, and you know, eventually it got to that point, but it didn't really start that way for me. So, the way I like to describe it, I always say I was I was young, dumb, and broke, and it was more so that I needed a job than I was pursuing a dream. Uh, but I wound up working for a guy who, amongst other things, was a commercial real estate investor. And I was fortunate to work very closely with the guy who did very well for himself and to learn a lot from him. So, you know, when I first started in that position, I was 20 years old. Uh, I didn't really have a lot of direction to where I wanted to go in life. You know, I knew that I wanted to own my own business and and run my own my own operation, but I didn't really have a clear picture of what that was. And, you know, after, after working at that position for a few years, when I first started, I thought, okay, I'll be there two to three years, kind of get on solid financial footing and then go ahead and do my own thing. Uh, sometimes life changes. You know, I started making more money. I started getting more responsibility. Maybe I thought I was important. And, you know, I was there for about 14 years. And when I got to the 30 years old, I started thinking to myself, huh, do I want to do this the rest of my life? And I thought to myself long and hard, did some, some real soul searching. And if I had stayed there, I wouldn't have been rich. I wouldn't have been poor, but I would have been, you know, I would have been on solid footing at least and always had a few extra bucks in my pocket. But I said, you know, when I first started here, I wanted to do my own thing. So I said, where did I lose that, that ambition along the way? And I said, well, you know, as I was hitting 30, I started thinking to myself and say, well, I, I don't have any kids. I'm not married. Uh, so if I'm going to take a chance and do something, I may as well do it now while I'm young enough to recover from it if it doesn't work out. And, you know, after a few more years at the age of 34, I moved to Charlotte and really went full time in the, the syndication space. And I said, let's let's give it the old college try and just totally uproot my life and and see what we can do with it. <laughs> I love it, man. You talked about really, you know, starting out young, you know, at 20, you know, finding this this mentor that you could work with and you were doing that for a while and, you know, had aspirations of being an entrepreneur, having your own business. Uh, but things were good. Right. And, and that's one of the challenges we face is, you know, when things are good, you're comfortable and things yeah. are good, but maybe not great. And, you know, it took a while, maybe 10 years later, where you really start to ask yourself, what happened to those aspirations? <laughs> and eventually you decided to go for it, you know, moving to Charlotte and going full time in a real estate syndication. Um, you are one of the managing partners and founders of Cashflow Champs. Explain exactly what Cashflow Champs is. Absolutely. So 
Cash Flow Champs, uh, like many others in our space, is a we're a syndication off, a syndication company. Our primary focus is multifamily, really in the southeast region of the U.S. But one of the reasons that we went with the name Cash Flow Champs is we didn't want to be tied to any one particular asset class because eventually, as we grow the company, the the intention is to take it in different directions and not have it be only multifamily. Made sense to me. All right. So talk to us about what you invest in now. I know my multifamily is kind of the, the core in the Southeast. What kind of assets are you invested in? So right now, most of our stuff in the past has been valued C-class type properties. Uh, as we go forward, we're still going to be doing that because that's really our, our bread and butter. But in the multifamily space, you know, I'd love to shift more to the A and B type assets in the coming years because I think that's it's just uh, an asset class that gives you more security and less grief. Uh, you know, I think the general progression for a lot of people as they come into this business is they always say they start out with the C-class properties because that's what you're able to win at the beginning. And then as you start having a little more track record, you know, you can go out there and compete on some of the the higher class assets and, and you make it a lower return, but you also get more, more safety and more security with it. Talk to us about that, Rick. I think I think that's interesting, especially for some of our you know passive investors or newer investors, you know, who maybe don't understand the logic behind that. So break that down a little bit more. When you talk about one, you know, B class, A class, C class, you know, someone may not understand those terms, right? So what exactly do you mean by that? And talk to me more about kind of your strategy of maybe starting with C and then eventually kind of ramping up. Yeah, absolutely. So. When you hear the letter grades, think of it almost like an academic grading system. You know, the, the higher the grade, the higher quality the asset. So most times the, the letter grade really corresponds with age. It can also correspond with major rehabs, but largely age. So if you have a property that's built in the last, you know, five, 10 years, that's an A-class property. If you have something that's built, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you're, you're more B-class. If you have something, you know, 30 years or older, you're looking more C-class a lot of times. And... The older the property gets, the more wear and tear it's going to have, the more issues that arise. Uh, now, now originally, I'm from New York, so older properties don't necessarily intimidate me because most properties in New York are on the older side. But especially as you start looking in the Sun Belt region and other regions of the country, you'll find that there's much less buyer and investor demand for properties that are built in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, a lot of buyers and investors want to see properties built 1980 or newer simply because there's less uh, less issues that come with them. The older any property gets, especially a multifamily property, there's a lot of wear and tear on the pipes. There's a lot of wear and tear on the wiring. You know, if you have a hundred unit apartment building, that plumbing is getting used pretty regularly. Uh, same thing with the electrical. So just through the natural course of age and time, those systems start to wear out. And you start spending a lot more money to make repairs than you may have expected. So, you, you know, the C-class properties tend to have less buyer demand. So as a new buyer, that's probably where you can be most competitive and have the, the greatest probability of actually winning those deals because you have usually a little bit less demand than you would for the higher quality assets and you have less uh, competitive competition. So if you're going out and you're buying in, a class, you know, 200 unit property in a major city, there's a good chance you're probably competing against some institutional buyers. Uh, there's a good chance you're competing against, you know, more established syndicators. You're probably competing against some international groups that may have lower return thresholds. So when you're going up against them, I wouldn't tell anybody here it's impossible to win, but it certainly makes it a lot tougher when you're competing against somebody who, for lack of a better term, money is no object. Uh, they're more concerned with preservation of capital than growth. And that's okay because that's the position they're in. So in the C-class property, a lot of times you're competing against other, other syndicators, many times syndicators who probably aren't as well established. Uh, and, you know, local mom and pop owners that have some money and they're looking to place it. So it makes it easier to win because the, the threshold is uh, a little bit lower than going against a, a much larger, better capitalized group. Yeah, I love that explanation too. The the way I always think about it is uh, demand, which is the word you talked about. So when you think about demand, there's buyer demand, right? How many other people want to own this asset and how many other people will, will want to own this asset in the future? So that demand is really, really important. And to your point, 
you know, it's going to be quote unquote easier to win an asset where there's not quite the same level of demand because there's more work. It doesn't mean it's a bad asset or anything like that. It just means that, hey, there's more work. There's more variables. There are things that you're going to have to plan for. It's an older asset. You're going to have systems that wear down and break down. So you have to plan for that. You might have a different, you know, tenant demographic that maybe requires a little bit more, you know, hands-on management. So those are the things that you're you're thinking about. And you also want to see that reflected in the numbers, right? So because there's a little bit more work, because there's a little bit more, you know, when you call it risk or less demand, you expect to see better returns, right? Or higher cash flow on these assets. When you go up to the A-class properties, well, now you're dealing with stuff that's very attractive to a lot of different people, right? And some people are not worried about the cash flow. They're more looking at the long game and you know, they're looking at capital preservation. So they're willing to accept very little cash flow for some of these assets. So there's a there's a there's a scale, right? And a continuum. And you have to understand where do you lie? And most investors who are doing value add investments, they're typically trying to balance that and look for opportunities where they can get cash flow, but there's still going to be some demand for that property in the future. Talk to me about how you balance that. You know, how do you balance driving cash flow while still looking for appreciation or equity upside? Yeah, great, great question. So you know, as you said, I think it depends on what the investor you're looking for. So a lot of times you have to know your investor base. Now, if you're using your own money and you're not going out there and you're raising capital, then it's it's more personal preference. But, you know, if you're raising capital, which is ultimately what I do, uh, you need to know what your investors want. And it's important to have conversations with them and to see where their heads are at. Are they more concerned with, you know, capital five to 10 years from now and just kind of growing their nest egg for retirement and for the future, or are they actively looking for money that they need to live off of? And, you know, understanding who your investor base is and what they want, and then also, you know, figuring out a business model that can serve them, I think will benefit you greatly on that. So, so the, the, the thought I would say is really understand your investor base, see what they want, and, what I always tell people, I say in the syndication game, you know, we're not really in the, the real estate business. We're in the, the finance business is what I tell people. And, you know, kind of like Ray Kroc had, was once quoted as saying, you know, from McDonald's, you know, we, we're we not in the restaurant business. We just we just sell hamburgers, but we buy, you know, we're in the real estate business. I say, well, you know, we're, we're really in the, the money management business. We just We just buy real estate. That's our tool. So, you know, in that regard, it's figuring out what that, that approach is and figuring out how to serve your customer base, which are ultimately the investors that are funding the deals for you. No, I love that. I love that. Let's talk more about kind of, you know, how you've been able to navigate the ever changing world of, you know, interest rates and just the overall economic shift from the last few years. You know, how have you been able to adjust maybe your strategies uh, and make other adjustments to your deal criteria? Yeah, so, so, you know, I think you have to adjust in any business to stay relevant and to change with the times. Uh, as we're recording this, it's you know, February 2024. So, you know, I'm sure for anybody who's been in our business for the last 18 to 24 months, you've probably seen a lot of change. Uh, so you have to shift and you have to pivot with the market. And, you know, when, when life gives you lemons, figure out how to make lemonade. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the, the best deal you can do is no deal. If you can't find something that makes sense, don't don't force it. You know, take a little, little time to to find that right deal because you want to make sure you're leading your investors in the right direction, uh, at least with the the best information you have available at the time, and then figure out, you know, how to how to protect them. Uh, when you first start out in this business, I think a lot of people have the impression that it's all about growth, and that's a great thing. But I would tell you the much more important thing is probably preservation of capital and preservation of of principle, because you want to make sure that you're doing the best you can to give people their money back and to keep that money safe, uh, growing it being obviously what we aim for, but but preservation being kind of a must. And that's that's an important thing that we always want to keep focus on. You know, uh, we believe in the same thing, right? Preservation of capital is, is paramount, right? And obviously, we want to grow capital. That's where investors, every investor wants to grow and make more money. But, you know, we, we want to make sure that we preserve capital first. Um, when you look at, you know, what's happening in the marketplace, you know, there are some folks who are unfortunately not preserving capital and maybe have deals that have gone astray. 
how do you what what kind of fundamental principles do you have to ensure that you are looking to preserve capital first and foremost, as opposed to maybe getting into some deals or situations where that capital is at risk? So it's a good question. Uh, I'm going to give a few things that I've kind of just learned for some some more insight. Things I probably knew in theory, but it's always different in practicality. You know, because like some of those operators, I mean, there's also a few deals I have that haven't panned out exactly the way we've hoped. Uh, in retrospect, I think one of the big tells with any market cycle is the availability of debt. And, you know, a lot of people, I think, don't truly understand how impactful debt is to these deals. Uh, you know, I always say when people say location, location, location is the most important word in real estate, they say, well, probably the second most important. I think that's the first one. And for anybody who thinks otherwise, I'd love to have them explain it over the last 24 months if they still believe location is more important than debt. Um, you know, we, we've obviously seen some significant changes. And I think back to September 2021, and that was the exact month that I noticed the, the agencies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, stopped sizing their loans to max leverage. And I thought to myself at the time, hmm, is it time to put the brakes on? And part of me is saying yes, because if the agencies aren't offering max leverage, there's a reason for that. Uh, but then on the flip side, I said, well, there is a legit housing shortage. You know, you can look at most markets in America, you probably have housing shortages in many of them. There's still availability of capital because there was a lot of money on the street, in particular after the expansion of the currency supply that we had in 2020 and 2021. Mm. But really, debt is the biggest driver. So in the future, what I would say, one, when you see that conventional financing becomes unavailable at reasonable rates of leverage, it's time to put the brakes on. And th that unfortunately was a lesson learned from experience, uh, but it's it's a valuable one and one I would offer to anybody in here. Uh, if there's a re if Fannie and Freddie can go to 70 an 80% LTV and they're only going to 55 or 60 or 65, keep in mind that's not by accident. There's a reason for that. And the second thing I would say, you know, a lot of people in the industry say market timing doesn't matter. I'm going to say that's true if you're a long-term buy and hold operator. And long-term, I'm, I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years. Because if you're going to be holding it that long and you're well capitalized, then you're in the position to ride out some market cycles. And as long as you're not selling the property... It doesn't really matter as long as the property is cash flowing and you're capitalized enough to, to withstand any issues that come up. Uh, in the syndication space, many of us are shooting for three to five year holds, sometimes seven to 10 on the long side, but three to five is definitely common. And for anybody investing in the last couple of years, a lot of them are probably one to two year holds, so people really got spoiled. Uh, so the thing is, you don't have a lot of time to be wrong on the market cycle if you have that short of a timeline. So... The way I always say it, I say stocks are like a a sailboat because they can move very quickly. They're nimble. You know, you can place a buy or a sell order and within seconds, if it's during market hours, it'll probably be filled. Commercial real estate is like the the Titanic, or maybe nowadays I should say like the the uh, whatever that new royal cruise ship is. But it takes time. So even in a best case scenario, when market conditions are very strong, it's taking three, four, five months to market a deal and sell it and really have that data hit the newswire. And then when market conditions slow down, it can be drastically longer than that. So you're not seeing that information hit the newswires within seconds like it would with the stock. It may take six months or 12 months or sometimes more than that. So, so data moves slowly. And because of that, you don't really see the market conditions until some of these things start hitting. So what I would say, you know, aside from just the availability of debt, I think being aware of the market cycle you're in, and my thought is, you know, if you buy as much as you can early in the cycle, if you're using that shorter timeline and, and that type of strategy, you'll probably do very well. If you buy later in the cycle, there probably won't be enough you can do to counteract it. So just be aware of the market cycles, be aware of the time that you're buying in. Uh, many of the most successful syndicators I know were probably the guys who were buying in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, you know, and even if they didn't know it at the time, uh, many of them, you know, had very good timings. They were entering the market and that served them well. And if that's done intentionally, that's not a bad strategy. You can do very well with that. It's just being aware of where you are and kind of how much room there is left to run in the cycle. 
I think that's really, you know, helpful for people to understand is that the cycle and the debt situation is really key too, right? It's not just a matter of, hey, here's a, a great location, here's a property, cool, let's underwrite it and go. It's understanding the market conditions, understanding your business plan, and then understanding what your options are. Uh, you talked about, you know, one, understanding that data moves slowly, which is, you know, key. And I always tell people, you know, anytime you're reading a report, it's already outdated. <laughs> you know, right. when you're looking at any report, it's outdated. And that's why it's so important to be plugged in real time to the market. You talked about, you know, when when the, the agency loans stopped doing max leverage, you know, that was a key indicator that, hey, something's shifting. They see something differently, you know, and, and what it was, I mean, ultimately was that they weren't as confident. So they wanted that owner, that buyer, that investor to have more skin in the game. You know, if yep. you're buying something with 85% LTV, loan of value, so you're only bringing 15% of the down payment. Well, if something moves, interest rates go up, you're already upside down. You don't have equity to this deal. So it's easier for that person to potentially walk away versus if that person has 40, 50% equity, it's going to be a lot harder for them to walk away. They're going to work a little bit harder to figure out how to make that debt service, right? To come up with that payment because they don't want to lose 50% of the value of this asset um, of their own money, right? Their own equity they put into it. So it definitely makes sense to pay attention to these signs because that's going to be the indicator of where things sit, the confidence level of your lenders, and also, you know, how deals can be done. A deal that works with, you know, only 15% down probably doesn't work. You know, in many cases, won't work at 50% down. And that's what we're seeing this stalemate currently with the market and where the conditions are. Let's rewind the clock a little bit though, right? We, we kind of jumped over how you were able to scale cash flow chance, right? We talked about making the transition from working with that other investor, you know, getting into the portfolio that you have today. Talk to me about kind of that, that transitional period when you were building this up and kind of getting things going, what was that time period like? Yeah, to totally. So, for me personally, I, I had actually started in syndication with the different partnerships. So Cash Flow Champs is my my second one. Um, so, I, so I kind of had some of the the know how and the and the systems already in place. But with any partnership, just like a team in pro sports, there's a a period where you need to gel. And you, you know, most times when you look at a pro sports team, you know, if they come together for the first season, it's rare that they're going to go out there and win a championship. You know, they need some seasoning. They need time to get to to figure out where one guy is going to be on the court when they're in a certain spot. And it's just the same thing in business. So you need time for any partnership to to mature and to gel and to figure out, OK, you know, what can I count on this person to produce and, and what can they count on me to produce? So cash flow champs is no different. You know, we we initially started with some very heavily heavily marketed campaigns uh and we still do some marketing but we we've toned that down a bit for a few reasons one uh maybe we went too far over the top and there were certainly times we've had investors and other people tell us you know i get too much communication from you guys you know i'm receiving 14 text messages a day and it's a pain in the butt so you you adjust and you 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 know figure out what that right approach is uh the approach that we take now as more of a growth one is more a personalized relationship focus versus a, a wide marketing approach and it's seeing okay who are the people that we need to be targeting who do we need to be building relationships with and then just more actively seeking those versus a wider approach and, and in this business i think you know when you're asking people for 50 or hundred thousand dollar investments or in some cases more than that uh you really need to be providing a white glove service versus something that is that is, um, you know, that 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 that's like just cust that that's really boilerplate you're using for everybody. So the, the more white glove you can make it, and the more customizable, I think a lot of times people tend to really appreciate that. I think it's really helpful for people to understand that one, you don't come out of the gate with uh, you know championships. You know, sometimes it takes time for partnerships to gel to figure out how to work together. You talked about coming out of the gate with more marketing and maybe over communicating with potential investors and having to back off of that. And then also delivering a, a certain level of service, you know, to these potential investors so that they feel comfortable with the investment because it is a, you know, it's a big investment, right? 50,000, a yeah. hundred thousand dollars. 
that's a big investment, you know, that people are making. It's not like you're trying to, you know, sell them a, a coffee cup, right? This is a pretty big Thank decision. God. these individuals are making. So it makes sense to take that approach there. Um, talk to me a little bit more about the vision for Cashflow Champs. As you kind of move forward, you've had a chance for this team to kind of gel a little bit. We've talked about going from, you know, more value at C-class properties and potentially, you know, expanding up from there. What do you see as the future? Yeah, great question. So when we first got together, the intention was to do more deals and to do bigger deals. Uh, we all had... individual track records and previous histories, but we figured by coming together and creating a bigger team, uh, we, we'd be able to grow more and just utilize our strengths. Uh, with, with any team, you know, the more partners and the more people you have, the more opinions you have. So that's good and bad. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's balancing it out. And I think the, the, the future that we, we really, the way we envision it would be one in the multifamily space, you know, still doing some of the value aid deals that we're doing, but also doing nicer assets that don't require as much of a heavy lift. Uh, they're higher quality, bigger buyer pools and things that, you know, we could potentially leverage there. Uh, and then also going into other assets in commercial real estate class, uh, 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 other asset classes in commercial real estate. For me personally, this is probably going to surprise a lot of people, especially if they've heard me talk about multifamily a lot through the years. But the one that I'm probably more excited about, I don't know that my teammates would agree, is office space. Uh, I think there will be a big market there in the next couple of years. I, I don't think it's here just yet because that market really has to soften more. But as that happens, I think you'll see some really good buying opportunities. Uh, one of my partners is big on, you know, assisted living. Another one's big on hospitality. So we're kind of figuring out what asset classes collectively we may want to take the company into. And then also into some operating businesses. So aside from just real estate, as we see different opportunities that could potentially have a... Um, you know, potential uh, operating businesses can be great cash flow tools. And that could be something we could use to, you know, for ourselves and to offer to investors as well. I love it. You talked about really trying to figure out how to scale both from a in the multifamily space, moving up to higher quality assets, but even outside of multifamily, looking at assisted living, looking at hospitality, looking at office, you know, maybe there'll be some opportunities there in the future, uh, but really just trying to keep your eye on the market so you can identify the right opportunities. And I think that goes back to what you said, right? Naming the company cash flow champs. It's not so specific to one asset class. It really is a matter of, hey, What are some of the best investments we can make to take care of investors and the people we're working with? That gives you flexibility, uh, but also allows you a chance to look at different types of deals and opportunities. You know, Right. when you when you look at kind of uh, you know how your your team your team has come together, there are a lot of people who are you know maybe where you were in your first partnership or your first business, and maybe they they want to find those partners and build those relationships, and they're having a hard time either a identifying the right people. or B, determining what they need in a partner. When you go back to that formulation of your team, what, some, what are some tips and advice you would provide to somebody else who's looking to replicate that? Yeah, great questions. Uh, so I'll give you a few pieces of information, uh, things that I think probably work practically and maybe things that I've done wrong that you shouldn't do. <laughs> uh, one of the mistakes that I've probably made, and, and some, some that I've improved on, but I probably still need to do better sometimes, is, is aligning myself with people simply because I, I like them. Uh, and while there is something to be said for liking the people you do business with, sometimes... liking them isn't a good enough reason by itself. So you need to make sure that whoever you're aligning with, you know, actually serves a purpose and can fulfill the role that you want them to and need them to. So with any partnership, the first thing you need to do is take an honest look at yourself and see what it is that you're good at, what it is that you're not good at, and where you need help. So for me, uh, within our industry, I know I'm better... at the acquisition side. And I'm, I'm halfway decent at the asset management side, but the acquisition side is definitely my strongest. Uh, the capital raise side has always been my weak point. So I usually try to align with people who are better suited for the capital raising side because I know that's not my forte. Uh, so you need to know what you're, what you're good at and what you bring to the table so you can go out and find those partners. And what I would tell you is you want partners that, that probably have two things. One is complementary skill sets. 
And the second is similar values. So with any business, the values are probably more important. You know, you could always teach a person a skill, but the values are probably going to be something at the core that if you're very different, eventually you're going to grow apart and not together. So you want to understand what that person's time commitment is. You want to understand what their vision for the business is. Uh, if one person wants to go a lot bigger than the other one does, and maybe the other person wants, you know, just a good enough level of life where they can live a decent quality of life but not have their, their life consumed by it, that's okay. But it's important to understand that as early in the relationship as possible to make sure you guys are on the same page. So understand what you want and then find partners that are going to help you fill in those gaps. And if you like them, it's an added bonus, but don't partner with them solely because of that. <laughs> I like it. You talked about starting with that self-assessment, you know, really identifying yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, figuring out where you could use some help, what roles particularly you looking to, you know, bring into the fold and then finding someone, you know, and not necessarily just picking somebody because you like them, but making sure that they have complementary skills, complementary values, and that you can actually partner with them. And it does make sense to like the people you're working with, right? You don't want to partner with somebody who you can't stand. That's not going to be a foundation right. for a great relationship. Uh, but it's not just about, all oh, this person's cool. Let's go grab a drink. It's more, hey, you know what? This person really is a good compliment. And in a way, what helped me really was thinking about it more like a business. You know, you would never see anyone in business where they're doing everything, right? Every company, every successful organization, they have departments. And some departments naturally balance each other. And there's some natural friction that comes with that, right? I was in marketing. So for me, being a marketing guy, the finance people, they always wanted to cut my budgets, right? They always want to tell me I couldn't have as much money. And it always used to make me mad, but they kept us in balance, right? They had to make sure everything we were doing was profitable. So our creative folks didn't get too crazy and wild with their, their creative ideas. So there's always that mesh. And I think any good partnership has that balance where you have some folks who are, you know, grounded in, in one side of, Hey, here's what we need to be successful. You've got the other side that's looking at it. And when they come together, they work through those challenges so that they could find that right solution. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for folks who want to learn more, I know you got the cashflowchamps.com. They can check out. You also have a link tree link, which we will put into our show notes. Uh, I just want to ask one more time about, you know, as you look at the market, right? If you had a crystal ball and if you were figuring out uh, where you would start today, if you were a new investor, didn't have the background you have, but if you're getting started today, what would you do differently? Great question. Um, I always tell people you want to play to your strengths and you want to play to your strengths regardless of what it is. So figure out what you're good at. And I would tell you to focus more time on that. You know, you can work on improving something you're not good at, but most times you only become mediocre at that. If you take something you're already good at and focus on becoming great and then deliver that value to somebody, it usually gives you a foot in the door. So if you're really good at finding deals, but you don't have the money to capitalize them, then you need to be finding partners that can help you on that end. Uh, but you maybe you bring the deal and that's something they can't do. Uh, if you have a great Rolodex, I'm probably dating myself with that word, but a great Rolodex uh, of contacts and they have the ability to put money into deals and you, know, you can't find deals, then you need to go find somebody who can bring you that deal but you can put the, the investor capital to work by partnering with them. So it's figuring out where your strengths are and then just being able to really get good at good enough where you can be exceptional and then figuring out how you can get a foot in the door because of that. I love a great advice for anyone. Figure out where your strengths are and build from there. Uh, we are going to transition to our round of insights. Give me a failure or an apparent failure that sets you up for later success. Yeah, great question. Um, I always look at every deal and every failure as a building block. You know, there's a lot of truth to the saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So you want to go out there and you want to constantly be learning. You want to constantly be refining. Uh, in a lot of my deals, you know, we, we've had challenges where, you know, admittedly there was some self-doubt and we were like, okay, are we actually going to close this deal? Or are we going to lose all the risk capital? It's happened more than once. So, so it's not just a one-time thing, but each of those times better prepares me for the next. So the first time I did a deal in 2019, you know, my partners and I at the time, we were quite nervous. We had about $150,000 of 
of risk capital that was at stake. And by the end of our due diligence period, we hadn't raised a single dollar. <laughs> and we were a little bit nervous saying, boy, initially we thought this would be a cinch. You know, it had a $2 million capital raise. We said, oh, shouldn't be that big of a deal. So we started getting nervous and saying, huh, should we keep moving forward or should we just terminate the contract and get our, our money back? And we decided to move forward because we, you know, we didn't get into the business just to be on the sidelines permanently. So we said, okay, well, we're going to have to figure out how to make this work. Uh, so it did get a little nerve wracking. You know, we probably went back and we, we called everybody we'd ever known in our lives, you know, people from, you know, elementary school and, and junior high school and high school, you know, we got the old yearbook ad and started going through them and said, somebody here had to become successful. Uh, you know, so, so we, we exhausted a lot of contacts. Uh, what was the lesson learned there? Well, there was two lessons. One, sometimes you have to have perseverance to go through things when they seem like they're, they're undesirable. And two is that, you know, we were talking the wrong types of people in our business. Uh, I'm from New York originally. A lot of the people I knew had money, but they had enough money where they could buy deals like this themselves and they don't need to invest passively with people like me. So the, the partners I was with at the time, they came from a single family background. They knew a lot of people that were flippers and rehabbers and, and people that used the burst strategy. Uh, but it wasn't until after our first raise that we really thought about it. You know, who's, who's the ones that's least likely to give you money for, for your deal? The people who are out there doing their own deals because they're using their money, they're already putting it to work. So it was a, a learning lesson that we need to start going out there and building a different investor database because the people we have are doing their own deals. Why are they going to invest in ours? And in some cases they will, but in a lot of cases they won't. So we kind of shifted at that point. We said, okay, you know, we need to rebuild our network. Uh, we need, we need high income earning professionals. You know, what I always tell people is you need, you need the people who lack the, the time, the desire and the expertise to run their own deals, but maybe they have a few bucks sitting in an account that they want to put passively to work. And in this business, that's what you need. So. There were two lessons learned from that, and hopefully those help the, the listeners. Give me the, I'm sorry, give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Great question. Uh, I'm probably not the best person to ask this one to because even though I'm only 39, I do, uh, you know, I, I always say I, I probably live in the stone age. Uh, but, you know, with any real estate investor, I would always probably direct them to bigger pockets. I think it's a great resource and a great network. Uh, I say it's like a social media site for, for real estate investors, and you can also learn a lot through the forums and the blog posts. So I, I would always recommend that to people. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. So the, the one I always recommend the most is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And, you know, it's my favorite book of all time. I read it when I was 19. I should probably go back and read it again. Um, but what I always say it has a lot of common sense principles but sometimes things that maybe don't get used as often anymore. So I think it would serve everybody well to read it. You know, ultimately when you're in business and you're in real estate, you're in the people business and you need to know how to deal with people. What's a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? Great question. Um, a lot of times it's just conditioning myself and getting into a routine. And, you know, with anything in life, it's all about building habits. So, what I find is that once I set my mind to something, I just say, okay, I'm going to keep doing this. And then eventually subconsciously it sinks in because it becomes a habit. So if you want something enough, start taking the actions that are going to put you in that direction. And eventually you'll start to see the result. All right. Give me your number one insight for scaling a multifamily portfolio. Build as many relationships as you can, as soon as you can. Focus your time and your energy on the ones that are going to bring you the best results that you that you want. Uh, and then also work on putting the systems and processes in place along the way. All right, let's go to our, our uh, lighthearted question. I know you're, I know you invest in the Southeast. You used to live in New York. Where are you right. living now, Charlotte, right? Charlotte, yep. Charlotte, okay. Give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat in Charlotte. You know, in Charlotte, uh, most times just out of convenience, which is near me, I go to a barbecue joint called Max Speed Shop. But admittedly, while I have been in Charlotte for almost five years, you know, I will always have to say that New York probably has better restaurants. So if you're going to go my real favorite, it's Ellen Beach, Pomoni Gardens in Brooklyn. 
All right. I love it. Sounds like a great place to go check out. Charles, I enjoyed our conversation today. You know, you talked about your journey getting started. Um, I really appreciate the fact that you talked about working for this other investor for, you know, 10, 14 years uh, before taking that that plunge to say, you know what, I have my own dreams. I have my own goals. I want to do my own business. I want to go out and pursue this. And I think that's helpful for a lot of people to understand that it's okay to, you know, be in a good situation and be comfortable. But if you do want to pursue that, you kind of have to have something that jolts you out and take that risk and, you know, find ways to mitigate that risk as much as possible, which is what you've been able to do. Uh, you also talked about the origins, you know, getting started, building cash flow champs, you know, and working with your partnerships, what it takes to find the right partners and what your vision is for the business. You know, right now, investing in many value add C-class properties, but eventually looking to transition up into higher asset classes and transitioning, you know, beyond multifamily to also include maybe uh, office space or, you know, assisted, assisted living as well as hospitality. So again, great information there and appreciate you sharing some of these insights on your own journey. Again, for folks who want to learn more, they can go to cashflowchamps.com. And then also we have the link to your link tree in our show notes. Charles, thank you again for being a great guest to coming on Multifamily Insights. We look forward to staying in touch with you and hope you have a great day.